Hi, I'm Isaac Kotek, co-founder of ClassTrack.org, and in this video we're going to be interviewing Brian Jackson. This will be our first video in the Meet the Educators series. In this series we're going to meet different authorities on the subject of music education, music technology, course creation, curriculum, and all sorts of things around how we can improve education and really teach and inspire people with music. Brian Jackson is an Ableton Certified Trainer from New York that has worked in course creation, curriculum, teaching Ableton Live in schools and colleges, and all sorts of things around music education. I'm really excited to have his interview be the first one in this series. So with that, let's talk to Brian Jackson. We're just going to dive in. I have a few questions. Definitely. Uh, go for it. Very first one is, could you just uh, explain a little bit about yourself as a teacher? what you've been doing and maybe a little bit about your background as a teacher? Um, well, I was originally planning on becoming a college professor hmm. a long time ago um, and actually dropped out of a PhD program in psychology, East-West psychology, to pursue music full-time, hmm. which was already happening. So I kind of pursued the music thing full-time for a number of years. And then when I moved to New York in 2002, um, I decided to get into teaching music production. So it was a way that those, all those things merged. So instead of doing academia proper, I decided to teach what I was actually pursuing with uh, my passion, music, music technology, um, that sort of thing. Great. So, so were you having schooling around teaching techniques? Um, or was it just... Originally, I mean, originally when I first got to New York, it was just I was doing private lessons. And at the time, it was like Pro Tools... A lot of Pro Tools uh, lessons, mm -hmm. and I was also um, had a six-month stint as a Pro Tools instructor at IAR, which is like the oldest audio school in the U.S. Uh, Institute Audio Research on University Place. Here, it's been there since like 1970, um, and it looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's changed ownership like three or four times. But it was kind of cool to to go through there, and then. One of the guys from there left uh, to start a program at a college, and he brought me with him. Um, it was a guy named Richard Termini, who was well known for actually doing all of the drum machine and synths on Cyndi Lauper's records back in the day. I um, mm. uh, worked with like people like uh, people from Pink Floyd and The Fix, and uh, he was kind of like a New York staple. Um, and he'd been doing the education thing for a while, so he brought me with him, and I taught at this college for ten years when that program existed. Uh, in the meantime, I also did a been on and off at SAE, which is School of Audio Engineering. I was at DubSpot for seven months as their um, curriculum director for the production part of things. Uh, then I had my own Ableton Certified Training Center mm -hmm. here in Brooklyn for four years. Had an art gallery with uh, with two friends. It was called Devotion Gallery, and uh, we got gentrified out. We were, we yeah. opened up in Williamsburg when you could still get oh. cheap rent. Um, and uh, yeah, so got gentrified out of that. And been doing private lessons the whole time. So a lot of consulting, uh, private lessons um, the, across the board. So a lot, of, of course, a lot of Ableton Live uh, has been a big part of it. And Pro Tools uh, still do some of that and a little bit of logic, but a little bit of machine. But it's basically went from almost all Pro Tools to all Ableton Live. Mm. I definitely saw a crossfade about like six, six years ago, maybe five, six years ago where I was getting less and less Pro Tools students and more and more Ableton Live students. So hmm. that's a quick, quick uh, run through of the last, I guess, uh, 12, 13 years. So are you associated with any school currently or mainly just I, well, I'm a, I teach a couple classes at School of Audio Engineering. Okay. But that's, you're basically like an independent contractor there. And it's not like a college. Your classes are like four days. So I'll be there for four days here, four days there. Um, and I just teach three different classes there, so I'm very much part-time. Um, so mostly I'm still independent. Uh, most of my own private lessons and consulting and other production work and sound design and just basically music and audio stuff in general. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know how it goes, kind of being a, not jack of all trades, but being diverse, you know. You have, and, you have to be, definitely. Yeah. You have to be able to do a lot of different things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what you kind of described a little bit of what dis, what helped you decide to become a music teacher because of mm -hmm. your your past, but was there a specific drive and why you wanted to teach music? 
Um, well, I always wanted to teach. So like I was saying, at one point I thought I was going to be, uh, originally I thought I was going to be like a sociology professor and then I was going to be like a psychology professor. Um, and then I just realized that I didn't want to do that in the normal traditional academic environment. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to deal with the whole, the whole publisher parish and, you know, whatever school you get a job at, you move to, you know, mm -hmm. I just didn't want to do that. So um, I just realized I had enough knowledge with the music and music production and um, that that was a way I could do teaching, but do it with something that I was really interested in doing. Um, I did do bass lessons for like a little stint when I was still in California. So I guess that was probably the first time I started doing like private lessons and that was just music. That was mm -hmm. before I even really got into like all the technology stuff very heavily. Uh, like in the mid 90s, like my just was getting a computer with Pro Tools. I was teaching bass, um, and then I realized, like, once I learned all that other stuff really well, I didn't have to do actual music lessons anymore. I could do more, like, music technology and music production. Yeah, yeah. Um, Great. But, yeah, I wanted, to be, I wanted to teach, so it was something I already had an interest in and just figured out how to put those two things together. Hmm. Do, you, do you do a lot of classes online, or is it all... Um, I do some or? Skype stuff like this, but I don't, I don't have like my own online classes. Um, I've designed a lot of stuff. I have a bunch of tutorials all over the place, you know, like on Skillshare.com. They contacted me last year to do like a four hour beginner Ableton course for them. So I've done that and, um, which you can, you know, they're a subscription service thing and they have, it's mostly non-audio. So you can like learn how to basket weave or do marketing Mm -hmm. Like which fonts to pick in graphic design, or you can do an Ableton Live class with me. Um, yeah, it's kind of a cool site. But uh, anyway, so no, nothing online proper. I mean, I have that kind of thing. Um, it's mostly in person. Yeah. So one thing that I I see a lot on the at least electronic musicians is they're very much alone in a lot of ways. They're like in their own room looking mm -hmm. up YouTube videos and trying to learn that way, and then they get frustrated right. with it, and they're trying to like. Uh, and one of the things that I think is very important as teachers is that we help foster a community of musicians. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I'm just wondering what you have seen that helps you foster a community of musicians and students and mm -hmm. what you've done to help you connect with, with uh, you know, possible students and, and people out in the world. Yeah, um, well, I've done a lot of events in some way, shape, or form. It was great mm -hmm. when I had my own space. Uh, we used to host all kinds of stuff. So it was a, wasn't a very big space. It was only like 400 square feet. But, you know, we would have art shows up, and then we would have some music performances. Uh, not a lot of music, because we was a residential storefront above a, below apartments. Um, mm -hmm. Like Robert Henke played uh, at our space. We've known Robert for a long time. Mono Lake, one yeah. of the Ableton founders. Um uh, but probably like a lot of Max MSP kind of stuff as well. One of my partners is a computer music professor at Stony Brook at SUNY, and she brought a lot of her friends in uh, to do that kind of more like hooking up sensors to people's brains and triggering sounds. Mm -hmm. You know, cool Max MSP academic stuff. Uh, but I, I we did user groups there. I did classes there, and then you know for a while I was doing these things at a place in town called TechServe, kind of co-promoting it with Hank Shockley. Um, when it was like an advanced Ableton users meetup kind of thing. It was free, open to the public, along with Ben Casey, who is uh, now working for Ableton, but he was like one of the managers at that store. So we had our own little community thing going on there in Manhattan. Um, but uh, Ben is now at Ableton, and I don't have my space anymore. So recently, a lot of that stuff just kind of hasn't been happening. Mm. But it was basically by doing these meetups and events and, um, yeah, just, just finding you know, places where we could get people together to hang out and then usually we would uh, plan on hanging out afterwards so after the event or after the thing we'd go to a restaurant or a bar and try to get everyone to go and just kind of hang out more informally than like standing around watching people perform or lecture or demo um, and then that was a lot of fun um, but over the years I've tried to do events I used to promote like small venue um, music things DJs and live electronic music did that for years in San Francisco I uh, did a little bit of it when I moved here, plus then, you know, years later opened up the gallery space. So just trying to find places where people can meet um, around common interests. Mm -hmm. Great. And then you saw, I'm assuming you saw that also directly connect you with students that helped you uh, both get students as well as like yeah. keep them engaged. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, there's no question that uh, 
you know, every every event or so, someone would come up and go, hey, I want to learn X, Y, or Z. And then, you know, I'd give them my card and say, you know, you show me an email, give me a call. So, yeah, I would say I've definitely gotten a decent number of students mm-hmm. um, that way from doing those events. Great. Yeah. So, I mean, I didn't do it specifically for that, but I, you know, it's definitely, I always had business cards on me just in case. Yeah. You know, yeah. someone came up to me after I presented or just wanted to, you know, had questions, um, which often would lead into, um, well, this is a large discussion. I can't yeah. really answer that question <laughs> right now. Uh, maybe we should get together and you know do an hour session, mm-hmm. kind of thing. Great. Uh, so it sounds like you've done a lot of curriculum for both online school. You you did the Skillshare, I think it was called. Yeah. Uh, as well yeah. as you've worked with DoveSpot and other places. And I'm yep. wondering, do you have any tricks? Not tricks, but uh, tips for people in making their own curriculum for students, like things that you've mm-hmm. seen that really help. Uh, keep it engaging and interesting. Yeah, so when I, when I had my own place here, my own Ableton certified training center, I did all the curriculum myself. Um, one of the things I did is I designed it in a way that I tried to um, get a sense of like what would the questions be after, say, class three. And then I tried to make sure that was what we were doing in class four. Mm-hmm. So when people were like, oh, well, we just did this thing in drum racks, how do I now customize it this way or how would I sample my own stuff and I'd be like well that's next week um, and just like noticing over time the types of things people would tend to want to do next or have questions on next so um, I guess you know basically trying to predict the common questions and follow-ups and mm. things that are people are interested in um, and the other thing too is to try not to go too deep at the beginning so when people are starting to try to give them a really big picture of everything, and then with future classes or lessons, to then go back in and dig deeper into the stuff. So I try not to do like master classes with my students right off the bat. I try to do things kind of in layers mm. and let let stuff soak in, and then go back to stuff more in depth. Because not everyone wants to know all the advanced tricks and advanced tips, and um, you know they really want the fundamentals, even though they don't know. They think they want the crazy stuff, but then they realize they can't do it until they have the fundamentals. So. I think it's the same as teaching music theory or teaching someone to play an instrument. Like you have to have the fundamentals. So, you know, in the, in the intro class, I try to go through the whole, like, why would you use live? What, what are the workflows that make it interesting? That would make it why you'd want to use this instead of, say, Pro Tools or Logic or Cubase. What is it about live? And then they'll have questions. They're like, okay, well, that's the stuff we'll get into in more depth mm-hmm. later now that you understand why you'd want to use this. So, yeah, I've tried to do, like, I kind of think of the way I teach as, like, a spiral or a couple spirals, you know, where it starts out, like, kind of big, and then it can circle down in a lot of different directions depending on on what makes sense for that class or that student. Okay. Um, So, anyways, yeah, that's that's kind of how I approach that stuff or try to. Were you generally doing large curriculums, like, over 12 weeks, or were they more short? Both. Um, Yeah, both. Um... So the stuff I did for myself was I had three eight-week courses or eight class courses. They could go in eight weeks or in the summer I did these intensives where we went through all 24 in like two and a half months. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, so there was like three eight-week courses was what I was doing uh, when I was at DoveSpot. And this was, you know, in 2010, so five years ago now, uh, it was like six eight module, six uh, modules or six levels with eight uh, lessons. So okay. I was kind of in charge of making sure that was like staying up to date. I took over that from John Margulies, who's, uh, who was there before me and actually brought me in there. And so that was kind of written a bit already, uh, but the same kind of idea. I tried to tweak it in certain directions. Um, and I have no idea what it's like now. I've, like I said, I haven't been there in five years. But yeah, yeah anywhere I've been, I've tried to, tried to approach things that way. Mm-hmm. I was wondering, you know, what your perspective is about using uh, Ableton Live or just like music technology within schools uh-huh. and colleges and, and how, you know, either you might see it as something important that we mm-hmm. should be working on for for our students or, you know, j- just how you see music technology, specifically Ableton, working mm-hmm. in, in schools. Um. Honestly, I would say that is just as important as all the other musical concepts or just learning about music. So, not I mean, not everybody needs to be able to produce their own stuff. 
not everybody needs to like be an expert or be even really good at it. But anyone who wants to be a musician now, with maybe a few exceptions, should at least have a basic literacy mm -hmm. with the tools that are out there. Um, and there is, you know, there's like I said earlier, sometimes the technology drives things too much. But there is a point where it does present people with ideas and options they wouldn't have before. So there is a place for it to, to show somebody, well, hey, here are the things you can do with this technology. And that, that will inspire some people, especially beginners, because that shows them what's possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the people that, I guess, spend too much time with it that, where they start following the technology. But you have to first introduce it to people before they even understand that, that they can do X, Y, or Z. And so a lot of musicians, maybe if they're just a singer, they might just be a guitar player. Um, they will understand like, oh, I can do all this stuff myself or I can work out ideas before I get together with the, my band. Mm -hmm. um, I can try out things and it can lead to can lead to other opportunities for them as well. I mean, technology is not going to be diminished in our life in our recent in the near future, I should say. <laughs> it's not going to go away. It's not going to become less part of our lives. So, yeah. Um, and a lot of the jazz and classical people I bump into wish they had more of it in their programs now. Hmm. So a lot of jazz programs are still very traditional. A lot of the classical programs are still very traditional. They'll have a Pro Tools studio, but it's approached like you go in and you sing and someone records it. And you, um, So yeah, I've worked with a number of uh, students from the New Schools jazz program here. If they test out of their major, they, can, they don't have to uh, do private lessons in their instrument. And I'm on a, like a, a list of like probably a thousand different private lesson teachers mm -hmm. there, and they've all wanted to learn live with me. Anyone who's wanted to do something, so I probably had half a dozen maybe students over the years that tested out of their stuff at the new school and wanted to learn live for improvisational performance on stage. Mm -hmm. um, and they've been asking them for a decade to get more of that going there. So they have some technology at these schools, but yeah, I think there should be more of it. And the students seem to want more of it too. At, yeah, at the, the places, jazz, classical, the more traditional music schools. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm definitely running into that. That's why I'm so interested in this topic because mm -hmm. people approach me quite a lot. It's coming more and more so. I think mm -hmm. even just like, even the simple function of looping, right. recording and looping is just, yeah. can open up whole new worlds or kind of like what you were saying with um, recording, like laying down a scratch vocal before you go record just so people know what it's going to sound like mm -hmm. have an idea you know all those little things are very helpful in collaboration so yeah definitely um, cool well great uh thanks so much for taking the time to telling us about your history and your music and things you've learned along the way teaching thanks awesome a lot. man thanks for having me mm -hmm. to check out more of what brian jackson's up to go to formlabsnyc.com there you can see different classes he teaches, the things that he's up to, current projects, and all sorts of great things. So check that out and check out classtrack.org for our continuing series on meeting the educators, as well as more information around implementing Ableton Live in your school, in your curriculum. And check out other articles at our blog around music education, music technology.